They said they'd take their mom out of the house if I kept this up. And so we backed off on that. Well, their mom's lost 30 pounds. She's walking when she couldn't before her edema. She had all gone away. We look for all the different factors that are affecting a person's brain health in negative ways, and we help them overcome those. So you can think about a brain as like a boat. And if your boat is sinking, it's not just one hole in the bottom. We're putting together a really personalized plan to help people's boats quit sinking and to patch those holes. When I moved here to Hal's home, I knew this was my miracle. And I promised at that point I would do everything Hal told me to do. I couldn't carry a conversation without forgetting through the whole conversation. Also clinically depressed for over 20 years on three psych meds. <laughs> for the first time in over 20 years, I'm not depressed. I've lost 25 pounds. I love the diet. It works really well with my body. I had gut rot. I had so many things wrong with me that have all reversed. I'm just amazed. Okay, good morning, everybody. Once again, we have Hal Kramer's back with us, and he's got a couple guests with him, with him today to talk about, I guess, some neat stuff. So, Hal, why don't you maybe just introduce everybody real quick, and then we'll get into it. I'd love to, Sean. Thanks. First of all, I'm Hal Kramer. I don't know if people seen me on the previous podcast, but I own a Paradise for Parents Assisted Living Homes in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and I brought with me some real special guests today. Eric Collette is the CEO of a company called A Mind for All Seasons, who's doing amazing research into all kinds of cognitive decline, whether it's concussions to dementia, to children having traumatic brain injuries, any of that kind of stuff. And hopefully I got that right, Eric. And then Melissa is one of our residents who is sign is creating her own miracle. And it's that's what we really want to talk about today. And Eric's been a really instrumental in helping us do that. Yeah. So I guess Eric has got some of the concept behind Al, you're allowing the operations to occur. And Melissa's one of the products. So why don't we Eric, why don't you just explain a little bit more in detail what you do exactly and, and the, the philosophy behind what you do? Thanks, John. So we have a process that we call the enhanced protocol, and I'll basically boil it down to four words. We measure, learn, apply, and adjust, and then hit repeat on that. So we measure a factor related to brain health. We go out and we say, what does the very best research tell us about this thing and how to deal with it? We apply what we've learned, and then we make adjustments as we see what kind of results we're getting. And brain health is never about just one thing. Brain health is multifactorial, and we look for all the different factors that are affecting a person's brain health in negative ways, and we help them overcome those. So you can think about a brain as like a boat. And if your boat is sinking, it's not just one hole in the bottom. Usually there's 10 to 20 things on a list of 50 or 60 potentials. And we're measuring what those holes are through objective testing. We're putting together a really personalized plan to help people's boats quit sinking and to patch those holes. And then we're measuring and making sure that they're getting progress. And we're doing that with people who are children on up to the elderly. So that's a synopsis, really. Yeah, so that, and that's a very basic outline of what's going on. But what specifically, so what does the science show us? Because you said best of science. So what does the science seem to point to when it comes to brain health as it applies to children and, of course, in, in the older populations? What, what are we looking at right now? Yeah, one of the things that's taken us a lot of years to recognize is that there's a really straightforward formula for making any brain better. And this means whether you have anxiety or depression or Alzheimer's disease or traumatic brain injury, the formula is IA over E, which means immune activation over energy production. So you've got to calm the immune response and increase energy production. So really what we're talking about is mitochondrial health. Mitochondria are the energy producers of the cells, but they also are steering the ship in a lot of ways. They're influencing hormone production and neurotransmitter production, and there's the switch on and off for the immune response. And so in, in one way or another, when someone has a brain health problem, they have mitochondrial dysfunction, which means we've got to look at everything from dietary factors to sleep, to stress management, to hormones and nutrients and inflammatory markers, 
Um, we've got to look at neurotoxic substances that someone might be exposed to and reacting to. We've got to look at um, pathogens that might come from things like tick bites. So it starts to get a little bit complex, but the formula is you improve mitochondrial health. Yeah, that, that's in line with, uh, you're probably familiar with the work of Chris, Dr. Chris Palmer out of Harvard, who's written a book called Brain Energy. And I've, I've known Chris for years, and he's sh he's showing, certainly with his psychiatric patients, that by adjusting some of those things, he's had pretty pretty compelling results. And so how do you adjust those factors? Obviously, sleep is pretty obvious. Diet, that's very controversial. What is what is the diet? And then all these other factors that go in there. But And as Hal I interviewed Hal about a year ago, and we had a great response with that. He's been putting people on lower-carb diets, sometimes ketogenic diets, sometimes even the so-called carnivore diets with seemingly pretty good results. So what are the? how do you adjust those factors that you just mentioned? Great question. And you could really dig deep in any one of these particular areas. But at the outset, I'd say you have to personalize it. You have to come into a situation with an individual with a high degree of humility and reverence for how unique any particular human system is. There's literally no human body that's like another human body exactly. So that's the first thing that we have to do is take it on a very individual, personalized basis. But after that, we have to look at health history and life history and what things are contributing here. And then we have to do some blood work and we need to say, all right, what, what is the blood work confirming about the connections that we were making in looking at a person's health and life and what we're seeing there? Blood work confirms a diagnosis as much as helping a person make one. And then once we objectively understand some things, the, the intervention depends on what the factor is. For example, you deal in the diet space a lot, and we love the, the message that you're putting out there that, man, there's so much change that you can make through diet. If you understand dietary principles, elevated blood glucose damages the tissue of the body, period, that's just what happens, then whatever you do, you, you need to control sugars. So you can go down that pathway. That's a little bit different than, hey, we measured your uh, vitamin D level, and you were at 28, which, I mean, you're starting to get into clinical deficiency there, and the sweet spot might be somewhere between 60 and 90 nanograms per deciliter. So we're going to make some decisions about how much you might need to supplement for a period of time, and let's make sure you do that with a fatty meal because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and so you might have a specific intervention like that. That might be different than trying to rebalance hormones. That might be different than looking at a broken detox pathway uh, because you've, let's say you've got a problem with a gene called MTHFR, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we do to work around something like that? That has to be personalized and, and we have to look at the big picture. Yeah, and I guess let me jump over to Hal. Hal, obviously, you've brought Eric in here, so I'm assuming you're utilizing some of these principles within your own patients. How has that? How much of, of that have you utilized since I've talked to you last? Because I know you've just put up tremendous success stories over the last year or so since I last ran Indians. So what are you doing, Hal, with your nursing home or your, I guess, long-term care patients? We've had three residents work with Eric on and his enhanced protocol. We've signed him up for it. We've got the blood work done. Eric create and his team create what's called a roadmap. And then we, the roadmap basically gives us a step-by-step, -step, here's all the different factors. And we haven't, I, I'm a little guilty, we haven't implemented all of them at once, but the big thing right away was the diet. So I actually hired some cooks, believe it or not, I found them on next door. They're neighbors of ours here but there's some ladies who love to cook and i explain the ketogenic diet and carnivore with them and um they took it and ran with it now they research it and, and do make some amazing recipes um that are extremely low carb and that the residents all really enjoy eating we do we are using the carnivore i talked a lot about that in another the other podcast with some very the bariatric or very overweight residents. So we've got two of those. One of them we talked about has lost 230 pounds. The other one came to us two months ago. He's lost 50 pounds and his his blood sugar is down by 50 points. But 
to try to keep it concentrated with what Eric does, we, we're specifically looking at the dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah. Melissa's our, our star yeah. student. She actually came to us from your podcast, actually. Her sister heard our podcast together, called her, told her about she came down from Seattle. Her two daughters happened to live right near my home in Goodyear, Arizona. So she moved in in June. And I, I think maybe it'd be better for let her boast about her accomplishments than me talk about it to start with, if that'd be all right. Yeah, of course, that'd be great. Melissa, welcome. Thank you for doing this, by the way. And I am, I'm funny, I'm up in Snohomish, not far from Prairie where you are, and now you're down there in, in sunny Arizona. And so yes. I guess you, you'd heard our pe the podcast with Hal and I, and then the, I guess your daughters might have heard that and they convinced you to come down there and try it. So I guess maybe just maybe start with your story and what, what, what you got you there and what you've been doing so far. I have a big, big story. This, when I moved here to Hal's home, I knew this was my miracle. And I promised at that point I would do everything Hal told me to do. We had a phone conversation. I found out my lab results. I was completely freaked out about it. <laughs> my labs were not looking good at all. I've got stage three kidney disease, pre-diabetic. I had all these markers. I had de I was developing a history for falling. I couldn't carry a conversation without forgetting through the whole conversation. Also clinically depressed for over 20 years on three psych meds. Since coming here, I am <laughs> for the first time in over 20 years, I'm not depressed. I am <laughs> actually happy and it's a very strange feeling, but I love it. And doing the keto, doing the red light, doing the sauna hyperbaric chamber, all those things I've been doing have contributed to a increase in health. I've lost 25 pounds. I love the diet. It works really well with my diet, my body. I had gut rot. I had so many things wrong with me that have all reversed. I'm just amazed. My family's amazed. I was pretty shaky physically. I came in a walker. I went from a walker to a cane, and now I walk freely on my own. I've been taking advantage of the training here. I have We have trainers that come in active in walking. I've just increased my activity by a thousand percent. And for me, the most amazing thing is to sit here and be happy. Uh, in my adult life, I have had chronic insomnia all my life. We're working on ways to improve that. But of the three meds that I was taking for this, I was on amitriptyline, which I got rid of before I even came here. I'm working on the Seroquel and the Wellbutrin as well. So I'm um, taking half a dose of Seroquel. I will have the Wellbutrin as well. And I feel great. I, this is my miracle. I'm extremely happy. <laughs> as well, talking to you, you have no problem holding conversation. It's hard to believe that you had any kind of cognitive issues previous, which it sounds like you did. And was it at a point, because obviously Hal is an inpatient place, and were you at a point where you're feeling like it's hard for me to live independently by myself? Was it coming to that where this sort of inpatient facility was basically the only option at that point? Yes. As I said, my history for falling was getting worse and worse. In March, I had a fall where I actually did some damage, tore a ligament, broke bone, had bruises, multiple things going on with that fall. And my family actually came to me and said, you need something. <laughs> and my sister is the one who went online and research, found Hal, talked to Hal. We spoke with my daughters who then visited the facility and it was a go. And I had several conversations with Hal. I knew this is what I wanted to do. If someone had told me even six, seven months ago that I would even be thinking of keto, carnivore, or anything like that, I would have said, no way. But as Hal said, we have cooks who have made amazing food and made it easy. With this type of eating, I am sated. I'm never hungry. I begin a fast at 6 p.m. and that continues till the morning, usually about 8.30. It works very well with my body as well. I went from eating a high sugar diet Hardly do good things, proteins and whatnot, to <laughs> this amazing recovery, this amazing miracle. 
And I just want to spread the word. Yeah, thank you. So we're thank we're you trying for... to kick Melissa out about a month or so. <laughs> we love her, but we want her out of here. Yeah, that's unfortunate for your business, Molly. You're going to put yourself out of business if you keep fixing your patients. That's crazy. You know, and it's good. I had a good lot of people say that to me. And I, my response is, if I can make this business model work, I'll have no end of patience. There you go. That's awesome. And Melissa, I just wanted to just go back to you for a second. Obviously, having food prepared for you that tastes delicious is a huge part of this because people are like, I, I, again, I've not seen anybody successfully do a diet that doesn't taste good. It is it's just never going to work. And so, But I wanted to ask you, you, all these years, depression, multiple medications, falling, I don't know if you broke, sounds like you might have broke your shoulders, what it seemed like you were pointing to that. I saw plenty of my share of proximal humerus fractures and, and ladies that fell down all the time. It's quite tragic. But at any time, were you ever instructed by the healthcare team that had treated you previously, hey, you need to change diet to this or that? Was it just not a, not an issue or what did they tell you to do? Or what had you tried previously? Had you ever thought about diet might have an impact on some of the conditions you had? Having been an RN in the past, although I was injured very early on, I knew about good nutrition and whatnot according to typical medical views. I was even a vegetarian for 12 years thinking that was the healthy way to eat. The skinless chicken, the low fat, the it's crazy when you see how well eating a better way helps creating memories, creating, excuse me, recipes. I actually have a plan when I go home to keep all these things in motion to continue my journey. Part of my plan, I cannot mention this journey without mentioning Maria Emmerich. Mm -hmm. She and her husband, Craig, <laughs> they're amazing. My daughter kidded me and said that she was my Yoda. I love her books, and she and her husband are doing amazing work in the keto carnivore field, and she has inspired me. And between her and Hal, they've ignited my passion for this whole program and way of life. Yeah, Maria is amazing. I, I've met Maria and I've eaten some of her recipes and she does some really amazing stuff and very creative, very smart about how she does that. As far because obviously your result is, I'm sure you're just happy as can be about your result. Do you think this is something that a lot of other people could benefit from? Do you know, obviously, as you get into it, as people get older, you just know a lot of more people that have a lot of health issues. The older we get, the more people have health issues, whether it's early cognitive issues or a whole host of other things. Do you see this, what Hal is doing has wide appeal to a lot of people? I know Hal probably agrees, but just from your own experience, would you, could you recommend this to other folks? Absolutely. I'm on fire. <laughs> As I said, I have this passion. Uh, I share. It's ignited in me. I've actually had communications with Maria Emmerich. She has, I'm looking into being one of her coaches. I want to spread the word. I think everybody can benefit from this, so why not? <laughs> if it'll make your quality of life better, I was considering that I may not be able to live much longer on my own. I was not handling my bills. I was not managing in my life, and, and it, I was just sitting there depressed. How, if you don't mind sharing, how old are you? I, I just turned 70 last month. Got it. Okay. And, and it, it is, there's a lot of people, that's the end of the road, 70, and if their quality of life deteriorates so much, effectively, their life is almost at that point over if, if, if you start losing your ability to think and keep falling. Whereas yeah. now, heck, 20, 30 more years, who knows? It could be it could be definitely something that's interesting. So I guess, Eric, as far as what she had done, I know Hal listed some of the things, I think red light and hyperbaric and stuff like that. How do the things that Melissa has done fit into your program? Would you say she's done everything right or mostly right? Or, or do you, I guess she was part of what you were, you were talking about is what she was doing, correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll point out just a couple of things. First of all, red light therapy, hyperbaric, some of the, the medical devices that she's using are cranking up mitochondrial functioning and improving energetics. But on the other side, she's eating a very anti-inflammatory diet and she's doing things like getting more physical activity that stimulates mitochondrial bio biogenesis. And then if, if we were to actually go through her lab work with you and just talk about the things that showed up. She had hormonal deficiencies. She had deficiencies of key nutrients. There were problems with B vitamins that we were able to address. And obviously eating more animal protein helps with the B vitamin picture on top of everything else. So yeah, she's been a champ at applying these things. But interestingly, we just got done with our client review. We, we work with 
hundreds and hundreds of people all over the United States doing this type of work. And we go through every client every Tuesday morning and just review how people are doing. And so we talked about Melissa just a little bit before this, this interview. And Matt, who's been doing a lot of coaching with Melissa and how and guiding them through, had just met with them yesterday. And his report this morning was, Melissa's knocking it out of the park. We're so excited. We're so proud of her. But we identified several specific things that she either hadn't applied yet or that we needed to revisit. So, for example, when we rechecked her blood work, her glutathione level had not really improved. And we were scratching our heads going, why is that? What's going on? And it turns out somehow in the process of getting a prescription, which you have to have in an assisted living facility for everything, it, it got missed that she wasn't taking N-acetylcysteine or liposomal glutathione or anything like that to push that, that lever a little bit further. So there's constantly adjustments that have to be made as we look at these things and find out the kind of results that people are getting and see what else we could do to optimize further. We, we ordered those meds last night or those supplements. I'm so. not surprised. The reason, so how's not the first assisted living home that we've worked with on this. I, I have 16 years of experience running assisted living and memory care facilities. And I started this company seven years ago with the vision that we got to change this. This is not a good system. We've got to turn this around. So we work with others, but Hal has been one of the very best people that we have ever worked with. Because when we say, hey, this needs to change, we could get better results if we did this. Hal is all over it. And sometimes other people say, well, that might take us a little while. And Hal doesn't play games. He doesn't mess around. He makes it happen. And I love that about him and the homes that he operates. I think one of the problems there is I've gone through three or four doctors for my homes because they tell me Eric wants us to do hormone therapy. And the doctors are like, well, you can't do that for a woman over 65. They'll get breast cancer. Or my standard of care won't allow me to do that. Or my insurance company won't allow me to do that. But fortunately, Eric, through his network, found me a nurse practitioner who's all in on this. Uh, I, I tried to get her to be on this today, but unfortunately, she's tied up with patients. But so it, now it makes it very easy. Eric recommends something. She prescribes it. I can get it. And it's I, I don't know if it's my background in manufacturing, but I try to find how can we make processes more efficient and and shorter lead times and things like that. We've gradually assembled a really good team here that's helped. And it, it also helps to have such enthusiastic residents like Melissa too. Yeah, you point out to a, a major deficiency with sort of this population health-based prescriptions, algorithms that are there. And it doesn't allow for unique situations and unique individuals, which obviously you guys are doing something very unique. And so like these this hormone replacement of 65 year old is going to lead to breast cancer. So what are the other things that are going on? What are the risks versus benefits? And we have this just blanket no, which is unfortunate. And I think it's ultimately harming uh, people or, or diminishing their ability to improve, I should say. And I think that's something that hats off to you, Hal, for just making it happen because it's it, sometimes it takes. And obviously you're putting yourself out there and putting yourself on the line. I know you said it's you're fighting against a system that, that sort of likes the status quo. And as we know, in the dementia care, that that business is growing. That bit, that's a booming business. And it's unfortunately, it doesn't it's not very effective for the most part. And it's it's something that's very costly. If, if we look at healthcare costs, and you get a family member that has dementia, that's expensive care. It really is. Either you got to quit your job full time and take care of them, or you put them in a facility that's, that's not cheap to do. Look at it this way. Well, take Melissa's example. She came here in June. Okay, she's paying me a couple thousand dollars a month to stay here. She's probably going to go home in October. So what's that? June, July, August, September, October, five months, okay, of paying that. If, if she hadn't come to me, if she just checked into an assisted living facility, she's 70. She might have looked to 80, 85, I don't know. That's 10 years of paying those same rates in an assisted living facility and just going downhill. So not only is she getting her life back, but she's also saving a ton of money by going through this. And, and I'm not more expensive. I see assisted living ch facilities charging fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month. And they're gorgeous. They'll make the parade of homes kind of thing. But you're not getting, you're basically getting those standard of care medications. And we're not going to try anything new because we, that's what the doctor tells us. Yeah, it's set up as almost like a warehouse. You're just warehousing old people until they die. I don't mean to be crass about it, but that's effectively what's oh, going on. It is. 
and, and they're beautiful warehouses, but that's what it is. And what I loved about a mind for all season and Eric is he took it upon himself to get out of that paradigm and start his own company to change it. And that took a lot of guts. And I'm, I was really impressed when I heard that story. Yeah. It's, it, you know, go ahead. Eric. Sorry. I was, was going to say, I think Melissa's example actually leads to something much bigger and much deeper than just revolutionizing assisted living or skilled nursing. Because when we started doing this kind of work with other homes several years ago, very quickly, the adult children of the residents who were getting results like Melissa were saying, wait a minute, my dad had a dementia diagnosis and you just helped him improve his cognitive scores from 15 out of 30 on a Montreal cognitive assessment to 27 out of 30 in about six months time. If you can make that brain better, what could happen to my brain? And I think the real holy grail here is getting out of the sick care system and inspiring people to start focusing on wellness instead of illness. Let's quit waiting until the wheels fall off the bus and then hope we can do something about it. Let's quit waiting until we're sick and then hope that the doctor can prescribe some magical pill that's going to make it all better. Let's realize that a lot of the illnesses that people are living with for decades and then dying with are largely preventable including Alzheimer's disease. And so I think Melissa is an inspiration to younger people to say, I could totally change the trajectory that I'm on. I could have a way better experience and have a lot more fun along the way because I wouldn't be as depressed. I'd be more focused. And we live and work in a knowledge economy. Our brain is our tool. And the sharper that tool is, the better things go. Let me ask. So I, I think that's the bigger inspiration she is. Yeah. Let me ask you, Eric, with the, the 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 mind health. Is there a point where the dementia is so far gone that we can't do anything about it? How? I guess the better question would be, how far into the process can we start to turn it around? Because obviously, some you have to have cooperation. Sometimes the demented patients are sometimes are violent. Sometimes they're just really hard to deal with. You could still do red light. You could still maybe do hyperbaric. You could still do some of these things to turn it around a little bit. And then as you get them back a little bit, you can implement some of those other things. So how, because some people out there listening, hey, my, my mom, my dad's kind of pretty bad off. Maybe they're already in assisted living facilities. Maybe they're, they probably need to be in one. What, where's the turning point? What can, where can we make, where can we turn it around at? Yeah. Great question. I'm going to answer it in two different ways. First of all, I think the earlier we take charge of our brain health and we start optimizing things for ourselves and for our loved ones, the easier it is to get results because brains heal slowly. And if you look at a picture of a brain with advanced Alzheimer's disease, it's lost 50 to 70% of its mass. And the hippocampi, the, the memory center of the brain, if you did an MRI and did volumetrics, it would be in the first to the 15th percentile in most cases. That's hard to bounce back from. But the other part of the answer that I'd give is an experience that I had a number of years ago. Um, I was teaching a class at Boise State University called uh, Mastering the Art and Science of Dementia Care. And one of the secretaries at the university had a mother who was actually living down in Arizona in a long-term care facility. She'd been on hospice for two years because she kept requalifying. She was declining just enough that she qualified for hospice but she wasn't rapidly meeting the end of her life. And she had read uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's. And she recognized that my business partner, who's our chief medical officer, was actually one of the first providers in the world to, to train directly with Dr. Bredesen. And his techniques formed a foundation that we've since built a lot on. And she said, Eric, I can't bear the thought that my mom, at 94 years old, will die without me trying to do everything possible for her. Do you think you could help her move to Boise, where I live, Boise, Idaho, and get her into a memory care and try to implement some of these things? And said, I said, boy, I don't know, because she's really advanced. I can't promise you anything. It takes a few weeks to get all the blood results back. And you could easily get a blood draw done and she could pass away the next week and you'd be out all that time, energy, and effort. And she said, I don't care. Money's not an issue. I cannot let my mom pass without knowing that I could do every, that I've done everything for. Her. So I was going to be in Arizona. I did an assessment with her. She was actually stable enough. I felt like we could successfully move her. So she moved up to Boise and we started doing some blood work and doing all the things that we do in the enhanced protocol. 
And as we started implementing these shifts, I watched her go from a woman who, when I first met her, I put out my hand to shake her hand and she would just stare at me blankly. She didn't move at all. She didn't respond. And I watched her go from that to smiling and taking my hand and shaking it. I watched her go from totally wheelchair bound to walking with a walker and a one person assist. I watched her go from not speaking in two years to starting to talk again. First, it was a word or two. And then she occasionally said sentences. Now, I don't want to paint the wrong picture. This was not a cure by any stretch. This was just helping her get better results. And after a few months of that, she had a spontaneous hip fracture. She was dealing with osteoporosis, which most women in their 90s are are dealing with, had a spontaneous hip fracture. And uh, she went into surgery. They did a hip reduction. But your risk of death within 12 months from a hip fracture is your age as a percentage. And she lived up to that. Within a couple of weeks, she passed. And after the dust settled, I asked her daughter if she regretted all the effort that went into this, where here five months later, mom passed away. And her daughter, through her tears, said, I don't regret it for a minute because she knew who we were again. She interacted with us. She had a higher quality of life. It made a difference to all of us. We're so grateful that we did that. And that one experience convinced me that it's never too late to try to do the right thing for another human being. And if someone wants to roll up their sleeves and fight, I will do everything humanly possible to help them try to get a better result while still acknowledging that the number one cause of death is birth. That's going to happen. We can't stop that. That's part of the journey. But man, if we can change the trajectory in any positive way, why wouldn't we? Yeah. You look at, for instance, like uh, late stage cancer care, where we're, we're willing to spend, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars to maybe eke out a few more months of, of life and, and I'll be probably even low quality life. And yeah, you're right. Why wouldn't you? And, and this is probably a fraction of the cost of what something like a, like some of the late stage cancer care may cost. Let me ask you guys, both you and Hal, obviously I know Eric, there's a lot of things that you can adjust. Some of them are easier to do than others, like a hyperbaric facility. Not everybody has access to it. Hal, I guess apparently you, you now do, which is pretty cool. But can we say, what are the things like, obviously everybody can adjust their sleep. It doesn't take any special equipment to do that necessarily. Everyone can adjust their diet. That also doesn't take a, a special equipment. Some of these things may have a cost attached to them. Obviously, I'm interested in nutrition. I think that's foundational on a lot of this stuff. What do you guys think are the, the big ones? If we could just do three or four things, and then the rest of things are icing on the cake, so it's not a very good analogy for what we're trying to promote dietary-wise. What are the th- how, how could you rank order of, of an order of importance, you think? Why don't you take that first, Eric? Sure. It's a good question. It's both easy and hard to answer because let's say that someone has undiagnosed Lyme disease. You could do a whole lot of other things. And if you're not treating that really big hole into your boat that's sinking your ship, you're not going to have optimal results. But that said, overall, in general, there are some really foundational things that people need to do to improve their brain health. So here's a short list of them. We've already talked about diet. So whatever you're doing, eat real food, avoid processed garbage that doesn't even count as, as food, and make sure that you're eating in a way that you're managing sugars really well. There's a ton of research on that. And and I think I'm preaching to the choir with this community. The next would be physical activity. Physical activity is critical for brain health. It stimulates brain-derived neurotrophic factor, growth factor for for brain cells. So not only does, does it do that, but it's getting the blood flowing. And that's critical for brain health. Number three, sleep because that's when the brain takes out the trash. That's when the glymphatic system flushes out misfolded proteins and cellular waste and debris. But make sure that if you have never been screened for sleep sleep apnea, whether it's obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea, do a screening test for that. That's low hanging fruit. And there's a ton of people that are dealing with it that have no clue that they're dealing with sleep apnea. So you might be in bed for eight hours, but if you're not getting sufficient oxygen to your brain throughout that time, that's going to cause your cognitive functioning to tank unnecessarily over the long haul. Next would be stress management. 
We live in a really stressful society and getting good at things like meditation or prayer or squared breathing or other techniques to really manage stress makes a difference because we know that chronically elevated cortisol levels literally damages the memory center of the brain. And we can do something about that. Make sure that you also have novel cognitive experiences. This would be like brain training. I'm not talking about doing crossword puzzles every day or Sudoku, though there's nothing wrong with that. You just get better at those things. I'm saying do things that force your brain to make new connections, whether it's learning a language or going to a new city and maybe you use your GPS to find your hotel one time. And after that, you try to navigate on your own and you try to build new mental maps. It could be learning an instrument. Lots of things that will stimulate new growth and connections make a difference. Stay really well hydrated. So just those few things alone can tip a lot of things in a positive direction. And I I think there's a lot more that we could add to it, but that's a pretty foundational list. Let me go back. Melissa, let me ask you, if you don't mind, how you're obviously on the back end of this. You're obviously have have gotten a lot better. Probably going to be going back home soon. Sounds like Al's going to kick you out (laughs) because... He's a big meanie. No, I'm kidding. He's just, he's helped you. They've helped you so much. What are the things Eric just mentioned? If you were hopefully listening to that, have you like looked at these are the things I'm going to be doing going forward? And I'm also curious, I'm a huge proponent of exercise and particularly resistance training. I think it's phenomenal for anybody of any age. I don't care if you're a 90 year old woman or a 25 year old dude. What do you think, Melissa, what's your, what's been helpful? What have you found to be most enjoyable, helpful, and what are your plans for continuing this on? Because obviously you don't want to go home and regress back to where you were. Oh, Al had said in the comments, he was trying to unmute himself and it wasn't letting him. So maybe Melissa's having that problem. Yeah, I don't know. I'd say you gotta, they should be, able, should be able to, while they're doing that, Eric, I'll just continue with you. So your company is based out of, is it Boise, Idaho? Is that where you're located? That's correct. Okay. And and so are you, I guess, obviously you travel out of state, so you're obviously in Arizona. So is this kind of an, a national or even international type of uh, company? It, it is, yes. We have remote programs where we're able to serve people all over the United States, and we're beginning to branch out um, overseas to help people in other parts of the world. We're on a mission to save a minimum of a million brains by 2030 by helping them optimize these kinds of factors. Good luck on that. So Melissa, one of the brains you've helped save, Melissa, if you wanted to maybe add those questions I talked about a second ago about what you're planning on doing, and maybe if you talk, maybe the strength training aspect, if you were doing some of that. I began looking for resources in my area where I live, which is actually my daughter sent me a link for my city and volunteering opportunities. She said, okay, mom, your homework is pick three places you want to volunteer at. And I picked those places directly across the street from me is Swedish Hospital, where I'm a patient, my medical, everything's there. It's just directly across the street. And since injuring my back where I could no longer work in, in a hospital setting, I didn't have a career, right? Let's see. I also picked out a rescue center up just up the mountain for me, Cougar Mountain, volunteering there, feeding, whatever they need. Anyway, so researching those things, as well as setting up a date with the person in my area, my neighborhood, who is going to hook me up with a few churches. So things are set in, plan- in place. I actually have a hyperbaric chamber a half a block away from where I live. I live up in this little three block uh, radius of the Issaquah Highlands, and it has it right, I can walk. I'm amazed. Also, my community has, within 10 miles of me, I have several lakes. I have one that I can walk to. And so I've got all these plans to continue being social, to continue being physically active, and to continue, I want to share the message. So I feel like I'm fortified. I need to continue my education in this. And I'm excited to branch out and share my journey, my wonderful journey. Yeah, good for you. That's one of it. And yeah, Issaquah is just, I, I've been there several times. So it's not, it's a nice community. I guess, was it like Washington? You could walk, you could go to Lake Washington and 
some of those other things aren't far away. But do you feel as far as you had back injury, I think you said you fell and maybe hurt your shoulder, I think. Are you able to physically, you were on a walker and then a cane and now you're walking independently. Are you making an effort to continue getting stronger? I know because I know how, I know they were using, sometimes using something called an X3 bar resistance band training. Are you going to continue with strengthening your, your body as well as your mind? Yes, actually there's, I have a gym on the property where I live and it's just a few minutes away, three or four minutes walk down there. Also through my healthcare program, I do have a free gym membership, which I plan on activating and taking advantage of that as well. Um, Also, there's a volunteering opportunity for several assisted livings in my area in the King County area. So I'm thrilled at the thought of somehow getting involved that way as well. I love working with Hal. I believe in his program and I have the passion for it. Let me go. Hal, let me ask you, what's next for you? Obviously, you've had some exposure from podcasts and the social media now. I'm sure you're getting a lot more inquiries. Are you looking at expanding your operations? Is it realistically possible for what you to do because what you're doing is so wonderful and we'd love to see that grow and then of course other people duplicate it because ultimately you can't treat every dementia dementia patient in the united states but you can certainly inspire this style of care which is actually care and not just like i said warehousing people what's next for how in the facilities you have in arizona there we go believe it or not i'm still working on this model to get it into all my facilities. We've really concentrated on one facility and I'm working on the other three right now. I actually, I should say the other two because the the third one is the bariatric one where we're doing more of the carnivore weight loss kind of stuff. The first resident we had was 42 years old. The second one's 37. So it's a lot younger crowd for that one. I'd love to look into expanding but I, I want to get the model down really well and then lather, rinse, repeat, make it easy. One of the biggest challenges, uh, there's a lot of people who could definitely benefit from this, but finding caregivers is my biggest challenge. And until I solve that equation, it, it's really much harder to expand. But I would love to expand and figure out how to do that. But I want to make sure we get this down. And, and there's a lot of resistance to this. I have people in my other homes because I introduced, I was like, rather than just going whole hog into the enhanced protocol with Eric, we just started doing the keto carnivore diets. We had one guy, I think I just posted on Twitter, that's an older gentleman, and he came to us wanting to lose weight and start walking again. And he's he, we started him on the carnivore diet, and he started losing weight that way, but he just couldn't face just eating meat and eggs and everything like that. So we switched him to a ketogenic diet, which still helps him. He's lost 70 pounds, and he's starting to walk again. So we've had success there. But when I bring up, I want to do more and more of this. I have a family that I'm fighting right now that absolutely does not want their mom on any kind of ketogenic diet. They think it's only for epilepsy. And they want their, they said they'd take their mom out of the house if I kept this up. And so we backed off on that. Their mom's lost 30 pounds. She's walking when she couldn't before her edema. She had very strong legs, things like that, all gone away. So it's challenging. It's not as easy as I thought to get this message across. Your crowd here gets it, are enthusiastic behind it, but there's a lot of people who aren't. And I still have to fill my homes. I still have to have cash flow and pay my caregivers and pay my mortgage and everything like that. So it, I would, I'd love to put everyone in my homes to be like Melissa. But it's it's slow going, even though I'm getting this exposure on podcasts and social media and all that kind of stuff. Hopefully, you'll be seen as a specialty care facility where people that actually are on board with the program. And you're right, it's so much easier when people are, are already sold on the idea. When you try to convince a skeptical crowd, it's like pulling teeth in many ways. But I got I would imagine in uh, going forward, because I see this with healthcare providers that adopt this, they become happier. They're like, hey, I'm actually making a difference now. Whereas you go to an, a, a typical long-term facility and it's a pressing place. It's just like everybody's like sitting there in a wheelchair, their head down. And it's just not fun to be there. But when you start saying, hey, look, we're actually taking these people and making them and giving them their lives back and seeing them smile again and, and see their eyes light up and their cognitive function return and losing weight and be able to do more, that 
to me, if I was thinking, if I wanted to, where would I want to work? At some depressing place where everybody just gets everybody's warehouses and dies, or at a place where we're turning it around. And I imagine you can attract some of those people as this, again, you're still at early days of this, but as this grows, and I have no doubt it will, you'll probably be fighting off people that want to work for you that, that want to do that type of work. And it's got to keep, have keep plugging away. Eric calling me about it and everything, which is great. I think it, it's... <laughs> It is challenging, but I see it. The biggest compliment I've received recently is I have the Department of Health come in and I have a license with them and they inspect me at least once a year. And I've had several of those inspectors come in and go, hey, you've got a few things on your paperwork you could probably work on. I'm definitely not the most detail-oriented guy in the world. But they said, but we look around your house and, oh my God, everyone's walking around and talking and having a great time. It's like fun to come in here. And I think, because those guys go to lots of houses around Arizona and, and get a temperature of what's going on. And they're always like, your people are the the most healthy there can be. And some of it, you'll get someone who comes in your home that's 97 years old on hospice and is bed bound and has tubes coming out of them. And no matter how good I feed them, it's not going to get any better. But but it, if they're questionable, we've seen a lot. I, I had one hospice company tell me, we don't want to bring anyone to you anymore. You always get people off hospice. <laughs> and so they were joking and they still bring me people. But it's just, it's hearing that kind of stuff that makes it really fun to wake up in the morning and go to work. Yeah. I mean, what people understand what hospice is, this is what you do right before you die, basically. And, and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> we can change that <laughs> course. And, that. Yeah. Maybe you're not ready to die yet. Let's dial it up and tune you back, tune you up a little bit and maybe get you back into life. So that's uh, pretty amazing. And, and let me, Melissa, let me go back to you real quick. When you first heard about, I guess, maybe your daughters mentioned this to you, what were your initial thoughts as someone who was in healthcare as an RN, had seen probably very well indoctrinated and this is the way we do business. Were you very skeptical at, at all or what were your thoughts? I definitely had my doubts. Oh, carnivore, are you kidding? I love too many different kinds of foods. But somehow I recognized after my family had spoken with Hal and whatever, I just knew this was my miracle. This was my chance. My dementia was only getting worse and worse. Again, I had even put a daughter on my bank account. I was having trouble managing my life and thinking I have to live with, I can't live on my own anymore. So the fact that I just, I trusted him. So through this whole thing, that's what I do. I trust you, Hal. And Eric, uh, too. Things, I, this is a team effort. Amazing people working for him. The caregivers are loving and very caring. And so just everything. I feel like this is was is my miracle. Uh, so that's why I jumped into it with both feet. I even <laughs> promised Hal, which I've regretted num numerous times, that I would do the cold shower right after the sauna. <laughs> so I scream and some of the caregivers laugh at me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm doing it. Goodness, and, you're, uh, you're, you're in all the way if you're in there taking cold showers. So goodness, that's funny. But let me... <laughs> absolutely. You, you'd mentioned you were a vegetarian for a while. And now, are you eating things like steak and red meat and stuff like that now? And if so, how's that going? I'm enjoying a ribeye. I'm enjoying <laughs> all the healthy fats. I'm used to MCT oil in my coffee. I start... Maria Emmerich recommends getting off coffee. That's my one guilty pleasure I've cut back on. But anyway... I start my day and to be happy when I wake up because <laughs> I'm not a morning person. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Melissa's like our police force here too. <laughs> when like she'll call me or text me and say, Hey, did you know your caregiver snuck an apple or a banana to someone? <laughs> and I'm like, it's not eyes and ears there to help out. And we had one lady who it doesn't want to eat anything and we fight her on doing healthy stuff. And we finally said, well, what do you want to eat? She said, spare ribs. And so we made ketogenic spare ribs and Melissa ate them all right up. <laughs> I have enjoyed it. It's wonderful. My, when, you're, when your body is sated, when your gut rocket rot is gone, when you're feeling so good, why wouldn't you want to keep doing it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. 
We have just a couple minutes left before I have to go do another meeting, but let me just, I guess, Hal and Eric, if you could just share your contact, like if people are interested in, in either Hal, a family member becoming part of your program or Eric learning more about what you're doing at your company. Why don't you go ahead, Eric? Sure. Yeah. The easiest way to find out about us is to go to a mind for all seasons.com and you can find access to remote programs or in-person programs or things for assisted living and skilled nursing as well. So that's the best place. Awesome. How? For me, it's a paradise for parents.com. I have a pretty good website there. And then I'm on Twitter tweeting at Hal Cranmer. I post success stuff we do and fun things like that. And I also, you asked a question about low cost interventions you can do at home. I'm working on starting an email list and sending out emails, what we're doing. Um, if you go to bringmemoryback.com, I actually have a download of a little checklist of things you can do at home very inexpensively. I, I think also some stuff you might be able to do with insurance. One thing we didn't talk about is dental health and uh, going to your dentist and getting infections cleared up in your mouth can make a big difference in your uh, cognitive uh, health. So if you want a little checklist of low-cost things you can do at home, uh, you can download it free at bringmemoryback.com. Yeah, and those dental infections are usually cur courtesy of a poor diet that we're not designed to eat. So it's an interesting thing. I want to thank you guys so much, everyone, Melissa, for appearing and sharing your story, and Eric, and, and of course, Hal. Continued success, and I look forward to the, I just look forward to, to see what happens, how this plays out, because you guys are changing changing the way we're doing things. And I think it's for the better because we need to, because we're suffering as a society and it's only getting worse. And unless we do something radical, it's not going to, it's not going to change. So thanks a bunch. And for the rest of the folks, thanks for being here. We'll be back tomorrow. You guys have a great one. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye now.